Okay, good morning. Welcome to our worship service for Sunday, June 21st. Join me in our opening prayer. In a day when so many men are absent, we cherish the love of our fathers. Thank God for fathers who comfort and encourage. Thank God for fathers who build character and inspire us to greatness. Thank God for fathers who teach morality and model decency. Thank God for fathers who lovingly convince boys to become men. Thank God for brave fathers who have the courage to resist being absent. Lord, on this Father's Day, may we encourage more men in our community to pick up the mantle of fatherhood. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning will be read by Michael Foster. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 10, 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how, would more, how, would, how much more would they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, everyone. This morning, the title of my message is, Who Do We Listen To? It's an interesting passage that we're talking about this morning from Matthew chapter 10. And there's a lot of competing messages that are coming at us all the time. And it seems like even more so recently. So who do we listen to? Who do we pay attention to? Who should we pay attention to? This text begins with a very interesting statement about the disciples and the master and then the introduction of Beelzebul. Now, sometimes they want to change that to Beelzebub. And the passage is Beelzebul, which means Lord of the Flies. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Lord of the Flies, perhaps that takes you back to a place in time. But really, who do you listen to is the theme of this particular passage. Sometimes we listen to ourselves. We get caught up in our thoughts and we go round and round and round and we think about something and we get all wound up about it. Sometimes we listen to other people, friends, acquaintances. We listen to the still, small voice of the spirit. Sometimes we listen to the news, to the media. It makes a difference who we we listen to. And really, Jesus is saying, listen to me. There's things that, there's important things that I want to share with you that you need to listen to. Jesus talks a lot about fear in this passage. Have no fear. Have no fear of them. Have no fear of the one who can destroy the body. 
Instead, fear the one who can destroy both the body and the soul. So many different messages, so many different pieces that are sometimes shattered from the mountaintops and sometimes whispered quietly. But Jesus is saying in this passage, in many different ways today, listen to me. And when you listen to me, do not fear. Because sometimes the messages that we listen to do stir up fear within us. If we don't know for sure what we're hearing, if we don't know for sure what the truth is, or if it's just too incredibly overwhelming. Sometimes we don't know what to believe. We even have discussions in scripture about which passage do we listen to? Which one do we, uh, who do we follow? Which pastor do we listen to? Which scripture passage from which translation? Who do I listen to? What do I listen to? It's not easy to figure that out sometimes. Sometimes what we hear can cause problems in our own lives. If we believe something, we hear something and we believe something that's not the truth, that can cause a lot of problems. Because we make decisions based on what we hear. We also live our lives based on what we believe from what we hear. If we've heard over and over and over again in our lives that we don't count, we don't matter, or the world's not safe, we're going to behave in that manner. And in many ways, what we're seeing in society today is a reaction to what has been put out there about our black and brown brothers and sisters. So Jesus takes this passage and has a lot of different pieces to it. But realistically, it's do not fear. Listen to me and hear my message. And fear is a very powerful motivator. It's an incredibly powerful motivator to us. Sometimes we fear even those that are closest to us. We often fear political leaders. Those in power use fear and shame to keep those under them in control. They won't do something because of the fear that they have for someone else that they may do something. Jesus is aware that the disciples are going to face various circumstances coming up and that they quite possibly could feel a lot of fear. In a way, this discourse is a get out the volunteer campaign for the disciples. On one hand, the disciples are granted incredible powers to heal, but on the other hand, he denies them money, extra clothes, sandals. Jesus says, go. Go and spread my word, but it's not going to be easy. But do not fear because I am with you. So why does Jesus highlight all these horrible things that are going to happen to the disciples? Jesus is naming aloud the suffering that will be endured. And maybe one reason the people will not be disciples, will not follow Christ. And yet being able to name fear releases them from that grip. Jesus describes these worst case scenarios together with statements of reassurance and repeated calls to resist fear, to not be afraid. The most important element of reassurance lies in the integral relationship that is affirmed between Jesus and the disciples and through him to God. Do not fear. It's a recurrent dominant message. Jesus says, listen to me 
because all these things that you're going to hear around you are going to be frightening to you. Listen to me. I will bring you the truth. Jesus offers a warning. Whatever fate awaits teachers or masters also await the disciples and slaves. If Israel's elites call Jesus the prince of demons, which they did, the disciples should be ready for a similar response. So don't be afraid of them. Sometimes people react in fear because they're afraid of losing something. Maybe they're afraid of losing their power or their control when someone challenges them and they react with fear or they call someone names or they shame them to try to bring them back into control. We've seen that through church history with the use of shame and saying that if you do this, then you know, God's going to strike you down. But Jesus doesn't, is countering that. The claim that fear is a way to get people to do things, that shame is a way to get people to do things, it's a lot more accurate to say that love and care and mercy is more of a motivating factor than fear. The claim that whatever is covered up will be uncovered, which is mentioned in this passage, arises from the disclosure power of the gospel. Jesus knows that they are taking the gospel out there and it will uncover mistruths and untruths. It'll be part of their mission. They're going to be speaking the truth and it won't always be popular. Their simplicity, vulnerability, and dependence on God demonstrate the reality of God's presence and character in the face of the world's claim to possess real power. Even though doing so will bring suffering to them, persecution, the gospel must now be proclaimed in the light and from the housetops. It must not be hidden. For the gospel proclaimed and lived is the most powerful tool at the disciples' disposal and still the most powerful tool that we have today, the gospel that brings life. The threat of death, the fear of death, can be a very powerful form of fear. And we've seen that a lot in today, our fear of, of something that we can't see, a virus we can't see, but also the fear of death through other means. The fear of being controlled by another. Jesus' next expression of reassurance addresses that fear, the fear of death directly. The right to kill is one of the chief props that the government sometimes uses. Political powers use, kings use, armies use. And Jesus admits that humans exercise their power, but notes that they only have the power to kill the body. They don't have the power to kill the soul. God would be the only one who could destroy the soul and the body. God alone. Therefore, God would be the one to be feared as the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. This represents God's power, but it's not a power like the rulers often use the power. God comes in mercy and love. God knows the sparrows. God counts the hairs on our heads. God knows every little thing about us. God knows that we fear. But no longer does fear have to be the determining force in our lives because God has the ultimate power with mercy and love. 
the scripture is encouraging the disciples to remain firm in their commitment to Jesus and the mission that they're being sent upon. Even when that mission generates inevitable conflict, even within their families, we still see that today. People make commitments for the ministry and it's going to cost their family members something. Sometimes it means that their loved one's going to move away. Sometimes uh, if they're married to a, a pastor, it may mean that, that they will have to move or give up their job or their work. For families, it means that um, they may not live in the same place for long periods of time. They may have to change schools, go different places. There's a sacrifice when someone says they want to be in ministry. A sacrifice to themselves as well as a sacrifice to their families. And sometimes in certain cases, it has divided families. Maybe a, a spouse feels a call to ministry and the other spouse doesn't agree with that call. It can cause conflict in the family. And yet Jesus says, despite those conflicts, I will be with you. And if you've received a call from God, follow that call because God will give you what you need. You need not fear. It's going to bring strife. Sometimes being faithful to God does bring conflict. Sometimes speaking the truth brings conflict. Sometimes speaking the truth about Jesus' love and mercy brings conflict. Because being in a relationship with God should be life transforming. It should be something that helps us to be able to face these difficult times. It's something that lives within us, that makes a change in our lives. And if people can't tell the difference between a Christian and someone who's not a follower of Christ, then that says something about where we are in our faith. So Jesus is challenging and saying, there's going to be difficulty. If you say yes to me, that does not mean it's going to be this wonderful, lovely life. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be strife. And yet if you follow me, I will be with you. You need not fear. The call to discipleship renders secondary all other claims upon one's identity and allegiance. We are all called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Even if other members of our family, father or mother, son or daughter, our allegiance is to God. To take up the cross aligns to the disciples' mission and fate with that of Jesus. That is the humiliation, the suffering, the shame, the opposition, and death that Jesus persistently speaks about here. Now, does that mean that we don't consider our family members or we don't consider those around us if we feel we are hearing a call from God? I think it's always wise to seek confirmation. Who are we listening to? That comes back to that. Are we listening to wise counsel? Have we sought out people who are also listening for God? I have found that when God has something that God wants to tell me specifically, usually more than one person will bring that message to me. I might hear it through scripture. I might hear it the same message through a friend. Typically it's, it's confirmed to me and so it is also with calls in our ministries. We, those are affirmed or confirmed by other people. God brings people into our lives that confirm those, that bring wisdom. We seek wise counsel. We don't move foolishly. 
And that's where knowing who those wise counselors are. We're not just going to listen to everybody around us because not all everything that's coming at us is truth and not everything that's coming at us is wisdom. So we have to listen. So we consider those around us. We have conversations with friends, with trusted advisors. We have conversations with our family members. But it doesn't mean that our family members are always going to agree with the things that are happening in our lives or even the call that is upon our lives. And that's where knowing what the cost is to be a disciple, counting the cost, that there will be a cost to speaking the truth because it won't be popular because it may be condemned. We're seeing right now that split within racism. We're seeing those that are saying all lives matter. And sometimes I'm hearing people say, I'm not going to speak up because I'm afraid if I speak the truth about what's happening in my society, if I speak the truth about black lives and about 400 years of oppression and racism, that I'm going to be oppressed too. I remember I talked about fear. And sometimes we fear the loss of our power, of our control, of our luxury, our comfort, whatever it may be. But we're certainly seeing that dissension even now. And who are we listening to? What's the truth? Taking up our cross implies identification with the marginalized people, with slaves, with rebels, with the poor, with the unhoused, with the immigrant, with the unpopular. Those who were subject in those days to Roman crucifixion, those who feared the government, because if they spoke up, if they spoke against the government, they could be crucified, they could be killed. Because they didn't align themselves with or submit to those in authority. Jesus promises that those who lose their life, their physical life, as Jesus is talking about, will in fact find it while those who find their lives in the world will lose them. True life comes through Jesus Christ. The answer to fear then, that Jesus is saying in this passage, include a clear-eyed recognition of the facade of human power, even those rooted in the threat of death or shame or removal from a position. It's rooted in the awareness of conflict and division that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel of radical love, inevitably produces. And especially the deep awareness and conviction that God is present in this world with mercy and with compassion. Are we willing to take up that challenge? Are we willing to face the fear that inevitably comes along with that? There's a reason that John Wesley wanted us to use our reason to really think through what we're being told and being taught. We're not just swallowing things hook, line, and sinker. I encourage you to take a look at this passage even more deeply. And think about the challenges that Jesus is giving us. 
Do you feel afraid sometimes when the stirring of the spirit comes inside of you? I know I do sometimes. It's scary to have a candid conversation with someone else that you know has a different opinion than you. They may not like you. They may respond in a way that's less than helpful. And that's where recognizing where who we are and our identity comes from. And that's where recognizing speaking the truth in love. But then also going back to, like we've talked about before, being willing to then listen to the other person. Listen like you want to be heard. Because we are going to have differences of opinion. But don't be silent. That's been one of the one of the difficulties we've seen recently with racism. The church has been complicit complicit with this by being silent. By not speaking up for those who are lesser, who don't have a voice. And for many, it is a sacrifice because they're going out on a limb and they're going against others around them who maybe share that power and control. So today, if you're in a place of fear, take heart. Take hope from the place of the God of the sparrow, the God who loves us, the one who knew that you would be facing whatever challenge it is that you're facing right now. Take that, count the cost, and understand that continue to move forward as a disciple of Jesus Christ will have its challenges. And yet we have a God who walks with us through every valley, helps us face every fear, counts every breath, every tear, and knows what we're going through in a very intimate way. That is the God that we want to follow. And that's the message that we want to bring to each person today. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you that you are a God who loves us, who challenges us to discipleship, to follow in your path, in your steps. May we cling tightly to your love and to face the challenges and fears in our lives, knowing that you are with us and that you will help us to be light in a very dark place. In Jesus' name, amen.
What prayers do we have this morning that we're wanting to share with one another and with God? Wondrous God of the universe, who finds time to whisper your love to each and every one of us. We come to your altar with grateful hearts, with aching hearts. When you speak your love into our quiet moments, we thank you for that most precious gift. It's not a gift for us to necessarily hold and hide, but to proclaim from the housetops. May everything we offer to you May everything we bring to you, our praises, our prayers, both spoken and unspoken today, proclaim your love loudly to a world that often feels forgotten. Let's lift our hearts up to God in a moment of silent prayer. And let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our God, who lives in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And we come to our time of offering our gifts uh, for those who are uh, worship with Valley to mail your gifts to our PO box as our ministry continues. Uh, and Nicholas is going to play our doxology. And we're going to sing a, a, a hymn together, Children of the Heavenly Father. Join me in our benediction. Listen to what the Lord says. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and still I maintain my unfailing love toward you. I will lead you beside quiet streams and down smooth, uncluttered paths so that you do not stumble. For I have become a father to you, and you are my firstborn child. Go from here in confidence knowing that the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit goes with you. Amen.
Thank you for joining us this morning. This ends our worship time for Sunday, June 21st for Valley United Methodist Church. Mm.